Welcome to Wigton Wednesdays. Um, my name is Patrick Laurie. Um, I've never done anything like this before in my life. All over the screen as we speak. Uh, I am the uh, kind of host for the evening, um, speaking to James Rebanks, um, who is joining us live from um, Penrith and Lake District. James, are you there? I am there. Can you hear me okay, Patrick? Yeah, I can hear you. We were a bit worried earlier about internet connection, but if anything goes wrong, we'll be able to pick that up and we'll be um, back online in no time. Fingers crossed. I'm told it's no problem. It happens all the time. Um, and this is one of the joys of, of, of living, in the, <laughs> living in the countryside. Um, so James, you and I met for the first time uh, two or three years ago at, uh, and I actually wrote it down in my diary, although I spelt your name wrong. We met at the rare breed cattle sale at Carlisle. Um, and we talked for a bit, neither of us really knowing who the other was and then we came back in touch again about a week later once we both worked out who each other were um and i then went on and read your first book and um yeah we've been in touch um more when we met at the cattle sale and neither of us have any particular interest in dexters so it makes you kind of wonder then um what we were doing <laughs> what we were doing in that month but um we're here this evening to talk about um your new book english pastoral but I think it sits, it's such a, it sits as, it almost doesn't exist without Lakeland Shepherd um, having come um, before it. So um, I don't know, looking at it from the perspective, from a writer's perspective and from a lot of the people here who um, aspire to do some writing, you really, Lakeland Shepherd really, really broke the mold and, and, and rocketed you into, into a completely new position. How, how, do you how do you follow that? How do you, where were you? How did you even begin to start thinking along the lines of doing something else and writing something else? Um, uh, yes, thank you. Um, I, rem I remember meeting you really well, uh, very well actually, meeting you just at the top of the stairs in Harrison and Hedrington, wasn't it? And um, yeah, I remember coming home and telling my wife actually, I met this, I met this young man, that's as, that's as kind as I'm going to be to you tonight. Um, yeah, I said I met this interesting young man. Now, I still hadn't really worked out who you were, so years later to be doing this with you and to be a huge fan of your own book. We're not just going to talk about my, my book. I hope we're going to talk about Patrick's book because it's awesome. It's a fantastic piece of writing about farming. Uh, it's a real pleasure. Um, but yeah, getting back to the question, uh, the truth is with great difficulty. I think, I think writing anything that you pour your heart into is really difficult. And after my first book, The Shepherd's Life, came out, um, it came out just a few weeks before my dad died. It sort of... My main memory of that time is really of my dad dying, not of the book coming out. And yeah, for a couple of years after that, I, 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 I was trying to write. And the truth is everything I was writing was about my dad dying, really. I was just trying to process that. And I had lots of false starts and lots of moments of confusion. And then sort of slowly but surely, uh, I think you sort of start to come out of the, the murk and you start to see that something's shaping up in front of you. And I didn't just want to do another book like the first one, which was a sort of very personal um, story and a sort of defense, of, a defense or explanation of who we were, people like us were, sort of working people of the Lake District. Um, so I wanted to do something slightly more ambitious, which was to try and tell, which I think has a lot of parallels with your book, actually, Native. Um, on the one hand, these are sort of deeply personal memoir type books. And on the other, we're all grappling with the same thing, aren't we? What the heck happened in the... I, I, I would say English countryside, but of course that's completely inaccurate. I mean the British countryside uh, or the sort of farming landscapes of the world really. And yeah, for me it was fascinating reading your book, Patrick, because I read it about three weeks before I handed in my final manuscript and I had two thoughts really. I was reading it in bed and talking to my wife and reading a bits and laughing at bits and sort of reading some of these beautiful poetic bits. And I had two thoughts. The first one was, oh damn, he can write. <laughs> He's really good. <laughs> and that's always irritating if you're a writer. And then the second one was, oh, he's, he's covered some of the same ground as me. Um, it's about the speeding up of things, the increasing of scale, the sort of industrialization of agriculture. And, and you were, you were, I think you were grappling with what's lost, what falls off the edge, or what we forget about, uh, or whether we should even care at all about uh, the past. So, yeah. Does that... Does that make sense to you, Patrick? I think, I think I was trying to work out similar stuff to you. What, what's just happened around us? Why are, we, why are we living in this place right now? Yeah, I think that's, that's probably true. And I think um, it's interesting that there is a very, very, very slight age difference between us, James. But um, you have 
just been involved in this for that much longer and just seen so this is a very recent process a lot of the things we're both quite concerned about are really recent things that have happened to us um probably in the thick of it and i think probably you grew up at the very very end of of, of how things were uh, so i grew up right in the thick of the change and you grew up yeah you you got kind of got a taste of what i've always been kind of sort of reaching for and kind of feel the absence of um but i suppose in a way the big difference for me between shepherd's life and english pastoral is um shepherd's life felt like it was about people whereas english english pastoral is so much more about bringing people into wildlife bringing people into landscapes and nature and 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 that was kind of absent in shepherd's life and even when we were talking 18 months ago two years ago um you by your own admission were coming at this quite green quite quite new and even now you're you're you're, you're quite open about the fact you're learning on the hoof here um so I suppose in a way I'm kind of tickled by what what started you on this. What what I mean you, you had a very clear human voice, a very clear human tradition in the Lake District. And kind of a natural um that yeah, that, that combination of man and nature. That and that's what comes through much more in, in, in this more recent book. So I wonder kind of where that where that change of direction came from. I think um I think I think part of it I, I think part of it is romance really and nostalgia so I've got a very clear memory of my grandfather my grandfather's love of nature I wouldn't I wouldn't and I hope I didn't in the book overly romanticize that so yes this is a man that loves barn owls this is a man who whose morning is in, is is made better by seeing a heron or seeing a, an otter or something uh, but he's also a man that changes the piece of land he's on in very unromantic ways, and he's probably responsible for some loss of biodiversity on his land. But that doesn't stop me loving him or admiring him. And then, but I think the big, when I was writing the book, I was trying to think about why, why the public are worried about farming or, or why ecologists are worried about farming or why it just feels like a really contested thing. Um, and I'd known about this my whole life, but it wasn't probably... Um, it's probably only in the last 15 or 20 years that that's been coming to the forefront of my brain. I was a very, very, pr and still am a very proud sort of livestock farmer. Um, and I'm just looking across the screens here. We've got Helen Ryman in this room and I was talking to Helen yesterday. Hello, Helen. Uh, so you have a, this, yes, Helen's from a similar, yeah. Helen's from a similar tradition to me. So are you, where we grew up in these families where it was all about livestock, uh, your identity, your pride, your, your achievements were all around livestock. Your friendships are all around livestock. And that's, that's who I am, really. But um, I, th I think all farmers have been grappling with this thing, haven't they? Which is that they're becoming really unpopular or what they do is really contested or criticised. You can't pick up a newspaper or go on the internet without realising there's a whole bunch of people getting more and more angry with us or frustrated with us. Um, you just have to look at some of the David Attenborough stuff in the last week or pick up The Guardian any day you like. And what we do is contested, isn't it? So I wanted to grapple with that, really. And I probably, when I was growing up and dreaming of writing a book, it probably wasn't that book. It was the first book. It was about who we are and trying to explain us as a sort of way of defending us. And I think, I think the process of writing the first book got that monkey off my back. And I thought, OK, I wonder if I'm big enough to, to explore this other thing. And I wonder whether my family and friends would let me get away with writing about it, honestly. But, but in some ways, I'm, I'm, a, I'm an older writer than you, Patrick, but you're an older conservationist than me, right? You've been involved in this stuff for much longer than me. Yeah, but, but, but um, from all sorts of different um, backgrounds. So I I've, I've came at this through shooting and gamekeeping. So um, farming to me was a bit of a, a, bit of a bolt on. I think now we're very much, I mean, when you were... Uh, it was great to see you um, visiting yesterday. We're very much on the same page here on lots of the main issues around conservation in agriculture, but I think we've arrived from two quite different routes. So yeah, I think that's that's probably a fair comment. What what um, thinking about English pastoral and thinking about um, Shepherd's life to me, Shepherd's life seemed to me to be something like a uh, we need a voice, and it was like a demand for a voice. It was a demand for recognition, and now English pastoral feels to me in kind of a way like right now well now i'm going to use it um now i'm going to actually start start sort of yeah um, yeah, laying yeah down. I, 
I think, sorry, I, th I think that's a far more eloquent way of putting it than I did, basically. Yeah, that probably is that, Patrick. And um, I, spent, I spent two or three years agonizing over, over this book, trying to, because uh, I hadn't worked it all out yet. So I'm looking at my fields and I'm listening to these criticisms about upland farming. And I'm wondering about where the kill, are our kill use disappearing and why are they disappearing? Is it me? Is it foxes? Is it badgers? Is it my dad? Like, I'm trying to work all this stuff out. And from a position of less knowledge than you, probably, uh, until very, very recently. Um, and, yeah, and, and come to some quite uncomfortable realizations, really, that some of our critics are at least partly right, aren't they, um, about what's happened and what it's done, and that there's some personal and family culp culpability in that. And so, yeah, I think... I think, I think what you just said is far more eloquent than, than what I'm seeing. Yeah, it probably is an attempt to try and use my voice to, and I, and I believe something which, I don't, know, I don't know who else believes it, but um, I think the best defense of what we are, the best defense of small farms or traditional farms or native breed cattle or sheep is not that we can carry on doing what we've always done or what we did in the 1990s and nobody can touch us, nobody can criticize us. I think the best defense is that we're, it's always changed, it's always evolved, and that we can listen to some of these issues, we can listen to some of this science, and we can be genuinely good stewards of the landscape. And I think some of my farming friends don't want to acknowledge the difficult part of that conversation. And I just came to the conclusion when I was writing it, you can't duck it, you have to do both. You have to say, all right, we've got some things wrong, and then you have to, and I'm still working on this, then you have to try and be big enough to be part of the solution, don't you? But, um, yeah, but I want to. This is too much about me, Patrick. I want this to be about you. You, you've written this extraordinary book. Everybody's, everybody's here to see you, James. And I think probably all I would, um, all I'd add to that. So I worked for um, Soil Association for a while when you were the last time, not the last time, the previous time you were here to visit. I was still working for Soil Association on a program um, that was specifically designed to identify win wins for farming, for farming and nature. So stuff that farmers could do that would actually improve their business would also. Um, and I looked at some of these things and I thought, God, the world of farming that I was brought up in was basically lose-lose. Um, farmers were doing things that didn't necessarily make them any more money and actually were terrible for nature, terrible for conservation. Um, and actually, uh, that started to roll out again and again. When you look at, particularly here in Galloway, you look at some drainage schemes, a huge amount of money spent on draining areas um, to improve them for, for grassland. Um, and then from that, you lose all the biodiversity, you lose the wading birds, you lose the flowers, you lose everything. And in 10 years time, the drains are all blocked because that piece of ground is an incredibly difficult piece of ground to drain. And actually, you didn't, you, you, you haven't actually, you, you spent the money, but you haven't actually got the benefit from it. And it's a lose, that's just a lose lose. So um, it's really encouraging. There are lots of things you can do, which actually put, fit perfectly, perfectly well in with your business. And that comes We'll maybe come on to it um, in due course, but that kind of ties up to stuff we were talking about yesterday in the pigsty about about rewilding. And I wonder maybe we'll. we'll... Yeah, I think yeah, I think, I think you're totally right. So the, I think the first part of this journey for me was quite painful, because I, I grew up in a family where we turn, um, what do you call the Sunday afternoon uh, sort of countryside program? What's it called? Country file. All right. Okay. Um, yeah. we, we used to turn that on. John Craven would come on and tell us that farmland birds were disappearing or that pesticides were terrible. And my family would be howling, utterly hated this guy because he, he was the bearer of bad news that we were the bad guys every Sunday. And to this day, most of my farming friends absolutely despise the program and despise the man. It's totally unfair. Uh, but so the first part of our journey was really, really defensive, a sort of really knee-jerk, proud defense. And... And we would claim things like we'd never, we were what we'd, we'd always been. And there's a little bit of truth in that. The sort of, the core of the sort of livestock obsession has always been there. We were the same people as previously. But there's also, there's all, if I'm honest, there's a whole chunk of denial in there, isn't there? It's not the same farming as 100 years ago. It's, it's a faster tractor. It's a faster mower. It's had, you put synthetic fertilizer on, you spread the thistles. And the point isn't that the people that did those things are terrible. It was me and my dad and my granddad and people like that. But I, I don't know. I just, I just think we have to be really honest about that stuff. And yeah, it's, it's tricky. How do you, am I allowed to ask this, Patrick? How, how is it with you and your neighbors? Because you're 
one of the things I really like about you is I'm getting to know you more and more is that you're kind of fearlessly living out your beliefs, right? I think you might even be surprised by <laughs> me saying that, but you're, you're doing what a lot of people would think is unusual, aren't you? You're taking a small farm, you're, you're building, making a family home out of it, you're trying to farm these pieces of land that other people wouldn't, wouldn't be interested in necessarily. You're keeping rigged cattle, which even I scratch my head about sometimes, yeah. but <laughs> you believe in it. Come on, what, what, what's that about? Come on, you're, you're a fascinating man yourself. What, why, why do that? Is it sort of living out your beliefs or you just can't do anything else? I suppose probably, uh, and this was actually something I wanted to ask you, it's about, it's about um, belief in change. Um, so as much as I can, I climb up onto the top of our hill and I can see the top of your hill, we're really not very far apart with the Solway between us. And yet we are absolutely worlds apart in terms of um, land use history and where we're heading um, for the future. Um, and one of the things I get out of your book is, yeah, a huge amount of optimism. We, we can fix this. We can restore this. There's a, there's, you're not necessarily um, trying to throw us a blueprint, but you're, you're trying to show us ways around uh, many of the problems that we're in at the moment, showing that it's possible. Um, and I just don't see that. Just don't, I don't have that. I think um, what's, what's changing here is so permanent, so devastating, um, and so set in stone that there's almost no point in trying to battle it. It's, it's the die is cast. So from my perspective, I'm almost a little bit doomed to kind of live the life that in a way I, I almost feel I was supposed to live. It just turns out that what I'm doing is a bit marginal and a bit obscure and a bit weird. It, I hadn't reckoned it would be. I'm trying to do what I think I'm supposed to do. But I suppose probably to outsiders or, or to people looking in, it, it, it does look a bit like I'm blazing a trail. I don't, in my head, I don't wake up and feel like I'm blazing a trail. I feel like I'm doing what everyone's doing. But it just so turns out that I'm the only person doing it, if that makes sense. Um, I, I think that's what, if you forgive me for saying so, because it's public and I'm only just getting to know you. I think that's what makes you really interesting. And I think it's what makes your book really interesting because it's, it's, you're right, it's different from mine, isn't it? Your book is more like a, I'm probably using the wrong words here, but it's a little bit of an elegy for the, for the landscape lost. There's a great deal of love in there because that's your family's history and you're in that place. And then it's, there's a sort of stubbornness and a defiance and a recording of that change. And I suppose mine's, mine's a little bit more like a, I don't know what it is, like more like a manifesto that we can do this, we can sort it out. You're, you're right, you're in a different place, a different landscape. Uh, and it's, it's shaped us, hasn't it? It's shaped the way that we think, I guess. Yeah. But what, so one of the things, and, and we're specifically here to talk about English, English Pastoral by James Rebanks that everybody should go straight out and now and buy from the shops. Every good bookshop will have it. Um, but one of the things that particularly struck me in one of the conversations um, we had was that um, was trying to draw a line around what a book actually is and how platform to be slightly more evangelical as you have been in, in English pastoral and actually to to get um, um, your audience to, 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 to draw attention to the fact that you have that voice um, and I suppose in a way what I'd originally written and my day-to-day -day job is in pretty proactive pretty boring conservation circles um, writing funding applications and translating science into guidance for farmers and gamekeepers and stuff. Um, I, I do a lot of this kind of legwork all the time and actually trying to write a book that actually people were going to relate to is a very different thing in the same way as what you've done, trying to, trying to, trying to give people a reason to listen to you, trying to give people a reason to engage with, with what you feel is really important. Um, so that in itself is... And you had said specifically, and it rings in my head, and uh, specifically not just to turn a book into an extended magazine article. A book is something quite different. A book is, um, it's your book. No, you're right. I've, I've been really, because I've had a sort of slightly, slightly strange experience of, of publishing a book. I was really lucky. It was one of the sort of, uh, certainly the first book and the second one's shaping up okay as well. Um, it was a sort of book that broke out lots of people read. And it's been fascinating to me because I, I was quite green when I did the first one. I didn't really know what I was getting into. Um, 
didn't really know whether you could affect anybody's thinking or influence them or get inside their heads. And yeah, I think, I think as over the last five or six or seven years, I, I, I'm really amazed at the magic that books can do. You, it's really difficult to, to write a book that, that affects anybody or to change the way that they think. But I, I think I'm the most aware I've ever been that a book is an extraordinary art form, isn't it? You, like, you wrote your book, Native. Um, I'm miles away. I get, it, I get it sent to me. Um, I spend whatever it was, three, four, five hours reading that book, and you're completely in possession of my head. I'm, I'm living your life. It, it isn't actually your life or your words. I'm, my head's turning your words into this kind of movie in my head. And... Um, and that's an extraordinary thing. There are very few things in the world now where you get that kind of attention span, where somebody gives you their, their mental focus for several hours. And I think that's what makes books magic, isn't it? That's, I think that feeling we've all had when we read another book is what makes it all so magical. Either as a reader or somebody who aspires to write or somebody who's lucky enough to, to break into this game, I think there's a kind of magic in that, a kind of alchemy. and. Yeah, so I think a lot of my heroes are people that wrote books that tried to change the world. And okay, statistically, it's very unlikely likely that I would achieve that. But I wanted to try, I suppose. I think I just wanted, um, wanted to try and do that thing that my heroes had done. So I, my heroes are people like Wendell Berry or Rachel Carson or even people like Jay Baker that wrote his book, The Peregrine, which I think is an absolute masterpiece. Um, and um, Jane... Uh, what is she called? Um, Jane, J Jane Jacobs is one of my favorite writers as well. Just this amazingly defiant woman who looks at the way that American cities are changing in the 50s, 60s, whatever, and decides that she, little old her, with a pen, can do something about this. You can fight back. You can challenge the ideas that things are based on. Um, I'm, I'm not crazily egotistically enough to think I would achieve all of that or that you would, but I, I'm interested in trying, yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, it does. Um, I'm just, I'm, I suppose I'm quite interested in the idea of a book being the access point, and then you, you, you feeding people through the access point, and they can take what they, what necessary the book um, to run off and put everything you've said into practice. But at the same time, it, 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 you hope at least that it can drive people on to engage with another level of the conversation if they choose to or they might put the book down and say that was very interesting but that's as that's as interested as i'm ever going to be in that so um right. what, what 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 slightly uh, appealed to me um in writing uh native is that i am trying to mark the transition from hill farming into commercial forestry and there are some very very powerful political and financial arguments to make that to make that a reality that's what's happening to Galloway at the moment at the same time it was really nice just to be able to say park the politics park the finances let's just look at the emotional transition let's let's present the picture here because it's so often decried they've done a they did a really good study recently um foresters did a really good study recently called the Esdale Muir study where they um monitor Muir and then they monitored the financial output from an area of commercial forestry. And the commercial forestry far outspread the sheep farm. It made, no, looking at it on paper, looking at it on a spreadsheet, it made no sense to keep sheep on the hill farm. And yet, Estelle Muir is one of the most heavily commercially forested parts of Britain at the moment. I wouldn't want to live there. I have a huge amount of respect for the people who live around Estelle Muir, but it's a lonely, distant, far flung, awkward place. And it's very easy to lose in the spreadsheet when you're doing those calculations. To actually forget people in there and some basic stuff like what if you love the place what if you love the wildlife that lives there i mean that doesn't figure on the on the bottom line but it's it's incredibly important and you can get to that through books exactly as long as you're saying that kind of alchemy of books you can you can almost almost put a value on some really important stuff that doesn't normally get a fair crack of the whip in conversation it's, that's right it's like that silly uh, philosophical thing isn't it Do, does a tree make a sound if it falls in a forest and no one hears it um, I, I, in a way, what you've done is you, you've made everybody hear it, haven't you? And when I read your book, I was really, I thought you were very, very clever in your use of, I can't remember what your, the old guy in your book's called, the guy that knew the farm before you were there, that, that yeah. sort of knew many of its stories. What was it's, he called? He's called Sani. 
Fun, yeah. Um, I thought that was fantastic because he, he was, or my, my reading of that was that he was, his stories, his culture, the culture of that landscape was, was gone, wasn't it? Unless you heard it and unless you told us. And I think that's, that's a wonderful, wonderful thing that you did. And, and I think I probably did more of that in, uh, in my first book, but I also tried to do it in my second book. So there was, I think it was imperfect. The way that we used to think about ourselves as stewards was, was obviously imperfect. But there was something in that. I remember, I remember really clearly my granddad's disdain of some of the changes in farming in the 1980s and 1990s. And yes, it, yes those things made it quicker or they made it more efficient, but he, um, he just didn't like it. And I knew he didn't like it, aged eight or 10. There was things going on he just didn't agree with. It was doing stuff he, he couldn't stomach. And um, yeah, I, th I think... I suppose the, the question is, what's our job, isn't it? And both you and I, maybe more than almost anybody else in Britain, I suppose, are in a position where we're writing about these northern farming landscapes. We live in them. We, if we get it wrong, we have to face up to our neighbours because we've said the wrong, something that they take exception to or whatever. Um, we have a deep effect. I think we both have a deep affection for the places where we are and the culture that we came from. And and hopefully are both bright enough to know that the world's changing and we have to find, we have to find a way to be in it, don't we? How do you, you kind of touch it there. You, you have your neighbors in your mind's eye when you're, when you're, when you're writing, I think probably even in conversation when you and I uh, have chewed some of this over in the past, you happen to be lucky in your neighbors and you have a lot of people who are quite keen to push in the same direction. But I mean, how, how conscious are you, of potentially flying in the face of kind of conventional agricultural um, sort of norms. Is that something uh, as big as? I, I, the, the honest truth is I was massively aware of it when I was writing this book. I thought, James, you get, you get this slightly off and you, uh, excuse my French, you piss everybody off. You piss off your neighbors, you piss off your uncle, uh, you piss off your cousin. Uh, you never go to the auction mat again without getting somebody uh, grumbling, um, second word off at you um I, I, you could get it really wrong and it isn't it isn't just that i don't want to be criticized if i thought i was right and it would upset everybody i'd still say it but um i, I actually like being part of my community like i'm sorry i'm not implying that you don't either but um it, it matters to me that i um it matters to me that i can go to a herdrick sheep sale and i've there's some sort of respect there you know just like it matters to you and um and I don't want to be alienated from my community. And I don't, I don't think I have to be really. So when I'm, when I'm with Helen yesterday and we're looking at a belted Galloway cattle, I think both she and you and I and many, many other farming people I know, they can, they can do this. They can be livestock people and they can see the beauty in a heron or, or a roe deer or a hare. And they're smart enough to, to yes, have to do, make some quite tough choices to make a living, but also smart enough to read whatever book it might be that tells us what we're doing to curl use or, or black grass or whatever it might be. I think we're, I think we, are, we all have way more capacity to learn. So, so yeah, it does matter to me. I, I did agonize over it. Uh, if I'm really honest, I wanted to write a book that they, that some of them would read and whether they're rewilders or nature conservation people or my non-farming neighbors, I sort of was try, trying very hard in my mind to stitch together a narrative that, as many people as possible would, would follow and, and give the time of day. And yeah, and I think the structure of the book was partly to achieve that. So I worked work with an amazing editor and I think part of, if, if I've achieved that, and that's for other people to decide, it would be because we, we un, I sort of unfolded what happened through a very personal story. So I, I think whatever your views on this stuff, I, I was trying to persuade you, you, the reader, to follow me through it. Uh, and unfold it in front of you gradually, um, rather than trying to beat anybody over the head with my opinion about what it was. Or, yeah, I feel like maybe I'm rambling. Come on, Patrick, help me out here. <laughs> no, no, you're, you're you're not at all. I on when it comes to I think probably working with other people because putting my it's quite clear that a lot of the schemes and a lot of the stuff that's got a lot of the funding that's gone into managing a lot of this work in the past has been so 
absurdly based on single farms um, without actually gathering the fact that a lot of these farms are part of a much bigger landscape and actually there's no point doing like um, water quality work or work for the conservation of birds that actually have wings and can fly. There's no point doing it on a single field. You've got to do it um, with a number of different landowners working in the same kind of direction. So I suppose probably that's that's the thrust of my my question to you originally, I think, was was uh, probably had a bit of envy in it because um, you've got um, you're working in a relatively I, I haven't yet been to visit you and I'm going to come and visit you. Um, you're working in a in a landscape that feels from your photographs and from what you've said, it feels it feels kind of cohesive. It feels like it's people on similar pieces of ground, whereas I think one of the problems I struggle here from incredibly intensive grassland management to incredibly intensive forestry to a little piece of hill ground that's being managed by somebody like me back into commercial forestry, back into a really, really intensive silage field. It's very disparate land ownership and it's very difficult to get people in the room together to pull in the same direction. So in a way, I kind of look at where you are with, with a certain amount of envy. And, and to some extent, I suppose, the pattern of land ownership in Galloway um, gives me a bit more of a free reign because I'm less concerned what people think about me because I'm not I'm clearly not trying to make money out of softwood forestry I'm clearly not trying to run a, a thousand cow dairy um, and actually what is interesting is a lot of the things that are good for wildlife um, are old they're old-fashioned things but they're not so old that people don't remember them so when I start trying to grow a field of turnips or when I start trying to grow a field of oats it's interesting my that because the average age of farmers in Scotland is 57, 58, 59, 60. Um, they remember doing all this kind of stuff and they remember curlews and they remember hares. We're still at this kind of tipping point now where a lot of these guys who knew a lot of this stuff and were delivering a lot of these real benefits now that we're desperately trying to work out how to pay farmers to do. It, it, it was the norm in the 1940s and 50s, um, uh, 1940s, 50s, 60s, 70s even. People knew how to do this kind of stuff. So in a way, I'm not I haven't turned up and setting up like a solar farm. I'm not trying to, to communicate with satellites. I'm not trying to do something they've never heard of before. I'm trying to do what they were brought up doing. And that's a huge kind of point of access to them. And, and again, I don't want to keep flagging it up, James, but yeah, there is a, a fractional age difference between us. But the, a lot of the things that are really good that we know now are really good for nature went out of fashion so recently that I bet actually you have clearer memories of them, even though the thing that's really striking me, Patrick, is uh, even my very commercially minded cheap farming friends agree with me, one, agree with you, agree with me, agree with most of us that there's something, something going wrong if something like a curlew disappears from the land. So the, the intensity and the speed of the changes, and you write very, very well in your book about the speed of changes, um, people know that's really recent. And I don't think that's particularly well under, I don't think what's happened in farming is particularly well understood by environmentalists. That sounds like I'm having a dig or a sort of cheap, there's some there's sort of cheapness to that criticism, but I don't, I don't mean it like that. I mean, uh, people only know these sort of labels, don't they? They know that there was, uh, they call it sort of industrialization of agriculture, or they'll talk about post-war machinery coming in, or the 1960s is pesticides. But what I, what I think I've seen in my life is the last 30, last 30 years have been profoundly different. And it isn't that those things just happened. It's that they happened everywhere, or they happened more than they used to. There's a sort of a scale, speed, intensity to those things, which has been the problem. And... Yeah, I don't know. I, I think I just wanted to try and explain that as best I could, really. And the fact I'm not an expert and the fact I am just a farmer and that it, I do remember something slightly different and I still know farms that are not like that. Yeah, I think that's just what I wanted to write about. Um, but even, even in my own family, like I had... I'm gambling that they won't be listening to this because they're not bookish people, but I, I even had like uh, family members who had huge, a huge pig farm. So when I was 15 years old, I've got a grandfather on a hill farm, farming in really quite an old-fashioned way. And then I've got like a, a, a relative about 10 miles away who's got 130,000 pigs and a fleet of wagons. And 
and has almost all the pigs in Yorkshire in this sort of huge big corporate business. So it was sort of mind, it was mind blowing at the time to try and get my head around this. I thought basically I was in the branch of the family that had, had lost, that we were just the, stu not so much stupid, but we just, just got left behind. You know, and I, I was looking around me thinking, is this my dad's fault? Is this my granddad's fault? Um, how do we get 130,000 pigs? I remember being like that when I was sort of 22 years old. I was like, okay, how do I, how do I become one of those guys? And yeah, and it didn't last very long, it, um, partly because that part of my family went bankrupt, actually. They, it was a sort of, I realized when that happened, you look at it and you think, this is a scam. This whole thing's a complete scam. It's not good for communities. It's not good for farmers. It's, it's a huge sort of corporate scam in which there's no money in it. And yeah, everybody knows already, but I would much rather have a landscape of small, smaller, more traditional mixed rotational farms with families like yours and mine. And I'm going to keep giving Helen plugs. She might sell me a cheaper heifer next time. Yeah. People yeah, like that. I, well, she'll never I, would have, yeah, I would have seen farms like that. Farms where it's full of pride, full of knowledge, and yes, probably full of compromise. It's not all perfect for nature in any of our farms, but that's what I want to see. Sure. It um it just rings a rings a bell bits and pieces when you when you're talking like that about uh, big commercial dairy here. It's a big thing I learned just recently is um, fifty percent of Scotland's milk is coming out of Southwest Scotland at the moment, um, and that hasn't been an accident. That's been a huge cranking up of intensification of of, of dairy here. Um, and one of the things that really rang a bell in your book uh, English Pastoral, available from all good bookshops, including the Wigton Bookshop. I've just had a, a note to come through to say you can buy English Pastoral through the Wigton Bookshop, um, Wigton Festival Bookshop. Um, is the idea of um, agriculture to learn about agriculture? Um, so, as you said earlier, I got into farming later on, and I went and did an HND in agriculture at the Barony at Dumfries. Um, and I gave up after about four months, five months of a two year course because um, it, was a, it, it was not information I needed at all. I didn't recognize any of the industry that was being described uh, to those kids, many of whom were, 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 it almost felt I might as well have done a course in, in knitting or, or, or cake decoration. It was, it, was, it, was a different, it was a different pace, a different industry, something else, something that I absolutely didn't recognize. And you had mentioned almost exactly that in, 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 in your book. Um, and the idea too, that we are creating, um, despite being aware of many of these problems, we still insist on creating the next generation of land managers on the basis of, okay, you'll be a farmer, you be a conservationist, you be an ecologist, you be a marine biologist. Yeah. It's, this, yeah. it's well, this approach, which like, we're still making the same mistakes now. We're still, we're still doing this. Even today, lectures will have been given at the local agricultural college um, where they specifically didn't mention things that, that it would be so easy to talk about and yet it's still happening even now. I, I, get, I get students come here occasionally and the first thing is they're absolutely disgusted that I've got almost no machinery because I'm not a tractor guy, I never was. So they look around and they're like, where are all the tractors? And then they, they realise I haven't got any tractors and they think I'm a lousy farmer. Um, and then, and then I show them things like, uh, we, so we have uh, like 30 acres of the last remaining upland hay meadows. There's only 3,000 acres left in existence in Britain. Um, so we, what is that, 1% of it or like 5% of it is this valley and the next, which is insane. Um, and I show them some of that and they, they can't process it. Some of those, particularly the lads, I have to say, the lads that were like me, age 20, they, they say things like, our professor, uh, our teacher would tell us that we should plow this out and put it, put ryegrass in. And you think it's 2021. We know this, this is a vitally important habitat. And yet the, an agricultural college, not a million miles away from here, um, is teaching kids the, the, like 30, 30 years out of date, sort of American ideas of destructive, exploitive agriculture. It's insane. It's absolutely insane. And yeah, but, um, Patrick, can I change tack? I want to ask you about something. I think there's a recurring thing in your book and mine about fathers and almost like, almost sort of what it means to be a sort of man in a rural community, really. And there's a bit in your book, which I absolutely adore, and I'm going to get you to read it, so don't say you won't. Um, 
there's a passage, isn't there, where you were young and you were, uh, I think you went to work on a fishing boat, I forget on which one of the Scottish islands. Yep, Can you um, read us that? It's absolutely beautiful. It's one of the most fantastic things about being a man that I've read in a long time. I'm not sure. So it's going to take me a minute to find it because you mentioned that you wanted me to read it. And I thought, no, I'm going, I'm not going to. Um, it's page, so, page 10 and <laughs> it starts, it starts with young people not staying Galloway. Page and it one, ends with we, again. Page 10. Okay, God's sake. And, and it ends with weakness is closer to the truth. I think it's genius and I think everyone should hear it. It's a hell of a long slab, James. It's a shame to drone on with that. We're all here to talk about English Pastoral, which is available from the Winkton Book Festival bookshelf. Come on, Patrick. We all want this. Come on. Put your thumbs yeah. up, everybody. Uh, we've still got time. And we've got some questions coming up as well. So we'll go. We'll get around this. Um, young people don't... Go on, James. All right. Um, pipe down. Well, young people don't stay in Galloway. They go to Glasgow. And I went with them for a four-year stint at the university. The city was a clashing novelty, but then I graduated and found Hebridean. It was a dark morning on the bus from Buchanan Street to Uig, and the rain lashed against the sweaty windows. An old Hebridean lady had made a fruitcake for the journey and passed it round the passengers as we slashed our way through Glencoe. The work was a lunge at something different, and soon I was watching killer whales pass our small boat at dawn against the silhouette of sky. Here was a fine place, but I was nagged by the knowledge that this was not my home. I didn't have the Gaelic, and I watched, I watched my friends at arm's length. They were born and raised in the Outer Isles, and I wondered how it would feel to have roots in that shallow turquoise water. I was just paddling my toes in their world, and I began to feel like a fraud. I envied the Dutch and German tourists who gawked at us on the jetty because they had nothing to prove. And the work also showed up my physical weakness and a lack of stamina. I slobbered with tears and exhaustion after 80-hour weeks, and I was forever shamed by the strength and power of men three times my age. We went over, over to Poor Tree for a drink, and one of the boys got into a fight. Pathetic. There was crashing and swearing, and I growled on the harbour steps like a dog pretending to strain on its lead. I didn't want to fight, but it was galling to find that I couldn't if I tried. Soft-handed people like me often say that manliness doesn't matter anymore. We make it seem dumb and old-fashioned, but I grew up around capable, bull-necked men, and there was no hiding from the shortfall. I said that I came back to Galloway because I had other plans. Weakness is closer to the truth. I must, James. Uh, James, I'm I'm tickled though because what, what, why, why that? Because there's all sorts of bits and pieces in that. I've spoken to somebody quite recently who said, "What an what what a strange book it is talking about men and women." Um, why specifically that? That's rung a bell with you. So there's there's two things I love about that. I think it's so good. I think it it should be put in anthologies with Seamus Heaney and Ted Hughes. And secondly, I think it's really, really good because you're big enough uh, to, to write about not being the kind of guy that has fights outside of pubs. And I think too many of us are still, particularly in rural areas, uh, are just learning that we're not that kind of men. And I deeply admire you for having that self-awareness and, and honesty. I think it's lovely. And I'm looking at all these faces and they're all really, really grinning and smiling and admiring your talent to do it so that's why i admire it it's nonsense james i'm afraid i would love to say that it's a, a like a spiritual awareness but the reality is that i have punched one person in my life and i broke a bone in my hand so that's the that's the end of that i did it so badly and so inefficiently that it did me more harm than it did him so as far as i'm concerned um I'm, i've gone i've taken the peaceful route ever since but you, you, you've had, you've had in um, looking back at Shepherd's life, there's bits and pieces of grit in that which make out you as an adolescent, you as a young man, you as a sort of a uh, sort of out or anything rough and tumble character. Does that has that mellow? Do you still feel that person now, or, or where does that sit with in English pastoral? Um, I think. Um... I think I'm less interested in me as a result of focusing on what, trying to work out what I was as part of the first book. I, you get to a point where you think, I'm not that interesting. <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just another person. I sort of told that story. Um, I suppose I'm more, uh, probably the person I'm most interested in in my writing is, certainly in this book, was my dad, really. And it's quite a difficult book to write because it's in three bits. My grandfather gets the sort of romantic bit of the sort of saintly, old, oldie-worldie farmer. And my dad gets 
um, probably doesn't get the best part of his life, really. He gets the bit where he's struggling in the 1990s. And, and that wasn't a good time with me and my dad, if I'm honest. Everybody knows that now. Um, but yeah, I felt, I felt bad writing it because my dad was a different man. That, 20 years after that, in the last 5, 10, 15 years of his life, was this really fine, decent, good man that I could see nothing, nothing but good in, really. And so it was hard. It was quite hard to write about him at, at a time earlier where he wasn't quite that. Um, and I think... I think there's something in farming culture where it all feels very personal. It all weighs down on your shoulders enormously. And I, I saw that as a weakness, I think, when I was maybe 20 years old and looking at my dad. And then now that I'm in charge of the farm and I look at all the things that I haven't done today that I should have done and the walls aren't as good as they should be and the cow that isn't as good as it should be because I didn't buy it off Helen. Um, I, I'm very aware... I'm very aware of, you know, you become more aware of your flaws, don't you? Maybe just some of that's growing up and getting older. Um, I don't know. I, I think the more fuss people make about me because of my books, actually, the more, I, the more aware I am of how I'm not all that, really. <laughs> so, yeah. Do you, do you find it hard? Sorry, on you go. Yeah, do, you, do you find it hard writing about your family? Because some of this stuff gets quite close to the bone, right? Yeah, it does. And um, I must say, I, there was a moment where I hit tipping point. You and I, and um, were, given we're in the, in the kind of semi-company of Helen, we, we've worked with Galloway's now, and they don't take any nonsense, and they don't take any, any sort of fluff or whimsy or anything, but actually what you're firing at them. Um, and I thought, in writing a book about Galloway's, I thought, well, as, as a narrator, you've got to kind of do the same. You've got to really not give a shit and you've got to, you've got to sh say it how it is and, and, and walk away. If people like it, they like it. And if they don't like it, they don't. And I thought probably given that I was mired in all sorts of stuff in writing that book, I, they, that I hit a moment where I thought, do you know what? Feeding with them, you lay it out and walk away. That's, that's, that, that to me is something I've always really been quite proud of about about Galloway and about about Southwest is that that kind of yeah. devil and, and there's there's another there's a very I'm sorry to talk about this because it's sort of personal and sad but there's a there's another story in your book which I think is very very beautifully handled which is the story about you and your wife struggling to conceive a child mm -hmm. and it's uh, I think anybody that's ever had any kind of struggles along those lines uh, will we'll read that and, and feel how real it is and how raw it was. And it's funny, isn't it? Because book, uh, as, as a reader, you read a book and you think, I, you know, I've just finished this book. I love Patrick. I think he's great. How sad that they can't have a kid. And then when I, when I spoke to you next to you, you said, oh, we've, we've had a little boy. So that, that isn't in the book, but it's, uh, so you could, yeah, it's, anyway, I'm, I'm very, very pleased that it ended that way. No, that's, that's kind of you to say at the same time though i mean the book the the publishers then said oh would i would i like to amend the book i was very keen always um that the book should be about that moment the book wasn't about my narrative my personal struggle for freedom and the final success the book was about here's a really really crap situation and yeah it is a really crap situation i know um you're not completely unfamiliar with it yourself so it it's it, it it's a horrible situation and it's weirdly a taboo it's something we don't talk about so Again, that kind of Galloway thing came back through, and I thought, well, well, piss it. It's 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 weighing down on me. Why wouldn't I say it? You, you. What's interesting is actually this is the first time this conversation right now, this second, is the only time in six months of the book's been out that anybody has even mentioned it. So lots of people seem to have read it, and and it's been in there in questions and been there in conversations I've had with people, but nobody's ever explicitly come out and said, let's talk about that. And and I, I was all. I, I thought I thought it was Let, let's think, do it. Okay. One of the things I really admire about your book is it's yes, it's about cows and yes, it's about curlews and yes, it's about land management. But you've you and I, th I think we we have to do that as memoir sort of memoir type writers. You you also wind into it some very personal stuff, and that that that's what I think the combination of those two things is what gives it all its flow and its beauty and and I think the. For anybody else interested in writing, I think it's a really good case study because you, unless you're giving quite a lot of yourself, the reader can sense it, can't you? I, I think you can sense with books when people are holding too much back and they're not really giving you everything. And 
a lot of the books I love, you think, crikey, I can't believe they've told me that. That's, they, they've really let you in. They've, they've given you everything they've got. And um, yeah, that's, yeah. Well, one of the things, sorry, we'll, we'll, go, we'll go back because we've got nine um, questions have come through. You and I, and as we generally on and on long into the night, um, and we've got a deadline coming up. Um, one of the things um, that's come through from Ange, who you and I both know, um, Ange has come through to say about uh, just a comment, an interesting comment about the idea of toxic masculinity, which links to stuff you'd said recently about the idea of farming being hard, not necessarily because it is hard, but because we almost kind of expect it to be hard. And actually a good farmer fights, a good farmer works really hard to do stuff. When in actual fact, quite often, um, there's shortcuts, there's easier ways to do stuff. And you shouldn't necessarily feel guilty if you've had an easy day or if you've had a fun day or uh, a day without um, wanting to beat your head off a wall. Um, that idea of manhood and the idea of what you're aspiring to when you're a kid, um, looking around at uh, your family and looking around at your family's friends. Um, yeah. We actually kind of carry with us and how much of the kind of the struggle we have is because we, we're expecting to have a struggle rather than um, that's it's actually inherently there. That's that's right. I was I was just looking. Uh, hi to Ange, by the way. Ange is an amazing writer. That's another amazing writer. People should read I, Ange. I yeah, absolutely. Yeah. She should be. Yeah, and um, but but she and you were right. I I was basically brought up that the best farmer was the one that was like last into the house at night, who d miraculously did more work than everybody else. That was never ill. Um, yeah, yeah, probably could brace somebody outside of a pub if was needed. It didn't hurt if you're sort of the tough guy as well. Um, yeah, it was all about sort of tough it, toughing it out, really. And and not only is that wrong, but it was it's a bit of a lie, isn't it? So when I think about my grandfather, who I admired in lots and lots of ways, when I look at how he was, particularly earlier in his life with my grandmother, and 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 maybe other women as well, you think, hang on a minute, that's not that admirable. And when I look at them, I look at previous generations and I think, were they, were they actually good dads? Were they, were, they, were they kind to their children? Were they, were they, and I, I'm not sure they were. I think there's a lot more drinking, wife-beating, bullying, exploiting weaker people than them going on in the history of the countryside than any of us would care to admit, if I'm really honest. And so, yeah, I'm not, there's a lot of things that I would, I admire deeply about the people I came from, but again, I'm not going to get too rosy eyed about it there. That I'm glad a lot of stuff that that stuff's dead and is now frowned on and is, has no place in farming. So, um, I, I guess the one I'm, well, yeah, I had one of my best friends when I was growing up was came out as gay when he was in his teens. And some of the, when I think back now, some of the things that were said in a rural farming community to that lad, by his own family in some cases, were, were absolutely horrific, beyond, beyond belief now. I mean, thankfully, things are changing very quickly. And yeah, as recently as like 15 years ago, I can remember hearing horrifically racist things said by, by some of my dad's friends, to be honest. And I remember thinking, I know that's wrong, but I don't really know how to handle it. And thankfully, that's disappearing and, and increasingly frowned on and shut down so yeah i'm not sorry i'm not trying to give a lecture on wokeness here but thank god some of that stuff's in the past is all i say yeah i i i, I get it particularly in terms of the heritage factor which comes through uh, again and again in in shepherd's life is this idea that you you, you almost have a pre prefabricated existence here's what you're going to do here's what you're going to be and as much as you want to do it um you have um kind of like a lineage people who and they and yeah. nobody ever seems to say, "Yeah, did they like it? Did they like it though? Were they were they happy?" Um, and quite well, often, go, go, on you go, James. Sorry, I, I, I don't think they cared. And and I think it'd be interesting if my dad was here. I could ask him. Obviously, my dad died five years ago. I think even my dad, until maybe about twenty years ago, I think if you'd asked him and he was being really honest, he'd have said, "I don't care if you don't want to do it." It, it was almost that black and white in our family. You did it because we'd always done it, and that's who we were. And personal choice, 
either in, this, this sounds crazy, but I genuinely think this is how people in my family thought until about 20 years ago. So if you fell in love with a girl and she didn't want to be part of the farm, she's not the right girl to fall in love with. I, I remember having conversations like that, like, like you should get rid of her, get another one that will do what you do. You know, you're like, what? Nobody would say this stuff now or hopefully think it. Um, yeah, I think, I think it, was, it was very, um, in good and bad ways, it was very communitarian. You're, you're meant to be, I think they call it Yanti's Law in Sweden, which is this thing that you're not meant to be an individual, really. You're meant to be part of a community and a tradition and a tribe. And you're not really meant to stand out. And maybe that's why I like your scene about being outside the pub, because there's a self-awareness there of, of not being quite in that tribe and perhaps never, ever being able to join that tribe. And I, I recognize that from when I was a kid. And I was probably a different kind of lad. I think I said this to you by message today. I was probably the lad that would have joined in the fight or, or probably the lad who started it by saying the wrong thing in the pub in the first place. Um, and I'd have been, I'd have been in, the, in, the, in the thick of it, not as a great fight, fighter, I hasten to add. And now I, look back at that lad, now I look back at that lad and I think, that lad's bored. That lad, <laughs> that lad needs a good book. He needs, he needs a good missus who's got the sense to, to take him home from the pub and say, you're not that person. Just grow up, do the thing. You know, that's basically what my wife did. So do you, who helps you the most with your writing, Patrick? It's, everyone needs help, right? Who helps you the most? Uh, it's tricky because, as we said yesterday, because a lot of the limitations around living quite far out and quite in quite an isolated place, um, I write to people a lot. I'm, I, 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 I have sort of a group of friends. And what's really useful, actually, is there are a group of friends uh, from university, mainly um, city based people. And I try and write about what's happening here. And it. Um, it's very helpful to, to know that these are intelligent people who just have different skills. And so you don't necessarily, it, it helps me pitch my writing more generally in that they don't have any of the context. They need to have stuff explained to them. Yeah. And I've got, in terms of help, I get a lot of help out of writing to three or four specific people that I write to pretty much continuously and have done for, 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 for some time. Um, and just quite often it's really helpful. Sometimes they say, but but why why have you done that and to me it's so blindingly obvious i feel that there's no there's no point even saying it because of course of course you have to let the hay dry for three days of course you have to do this of course you and uh, i wrote a big thing about making hay last year um and i got an email back that said um what's a shear bolt and i was like what do you mean <laughs> what, do you, what do you mean you don't know what a shear bolt is but that so i find that i find that really useful i find that really helpful but at the same time i like not i like not getting too much help I like trying to feel my own way and trying to lean on. I like leaning on on books more than people. I like I like um, I like to be a little you, bit. When, and and when when you're writing, um, I know all, all writers are different on this. Do you do you have in mind who you're writing it for? Are you one of these people that doesn't care that is writing it for yourself? Are you are you thinking of your little boy maybe reading it someday and you hope that he'll approve of you? Is it for those friends you write to? Is it for the great British public? How, how does that work in your head? Because everyone's different, right? Yeah, I write for, um, I have, yeah, I have a couple of people in mind when I'm writing. Um, but I suppose probably, yeah, it, it's, it's kind of an extension of that correspondence, that writing to and fro to people is always kind of the, the intelligent outsider. Um, and when I'm writing different things, I write to different people, but I don't want to have, somebody who knows exactly what's happening. I don't want to, I, I don't want to put some, somebody to come and say, well, that's wrong. That's not exactly what happened. Um, actually that's, so I like to be a little bit like to have space to be a bit flabby as well. But uh, in my mind's eye, yeah, I have a, two or three distinct people, but then again, I don't, I very rarely anybody. Um, you very rarely see these people, but I don't know. Have you got, have you got someone in mind? Um, I, th I think, I think with the first book it was simple. Um, it came from I. I remember one. The, the germ of the book was when I was was the start of the book. Really, it was being at school and thinking this teacher woman at the front of the class has no idea who the hell I am. Has no idea why I want to get out of this school. Um, has no idea how great my grandfather is. 
I think it was almost that teacher. It, it was sort of that simple. I'm going to tell the clever people. I'm going to tell the educated people who are we, and I'm going to make them understand us. It was, it was that sort of aspiration. And then I think, uh, yeah, I think I touched on this earlier. With, with this next book, it was rather different because I thought, oh, hang on a minute. Quite a lot of people read me in theory. If I get this right, quite a lot of people might read it. And I think it was a more... It was a slightly busier room full of readers that I was imagining. Um, people that cared about the environment and people that, that were farmers like us. So, certainly one of the people in the room, it, the room in my mind of people I was writing for were probably for some of my farming mates really that shared the same background as me. I've always, I've, I've never wanted to be a writer that was admired by everybody outside and then <laughs> hated in my own valley, you know what I mean? So, um, I, th I think it would be daft to write about farmers in the Lake District and write in really flowery, complicated prose. I think the voice of the book has to be a very blunt, uh, simple, northern kind of thing. And I, I don't know, I'm rambling. I definitely am rambling on this question, Patrick. Should no, we take no, some more questions? You're, you're not. Um, and we've had a couple of questions come through. Um, the only thing I'd add to it is, um, from my perspective, between the Lake District and Galloway, a big part of me, I must say, when I look over the Solway, I think, wow, the whole world loves that landscape and the whole world has no idea that Galloway even exists. So a big part of me, when I write sometimes, I think I'm, I, I, wanna, I wanna be a bit offensive. I wanna be a bit abrasive. I wanna say, set out the stall and say, yeah, fine, you may know about the Lake District, but what's happening over the water here is just as bloody good. And there's no reason why everyone goes to the Lake District and doesn't come to Galloway. <laughs> And there's that kind of like, uh, I was involved a little bit in the national park designation, plans to have Galloway designated as a national park. And again and again, it came out, well, Lake District have bloody got it. Why the hell can't we have it? And that kind of like settling a score kind of thing. Um, but I suppose that's a, that, that's a big difference between the two of us is everybody knows your landscape and nobody knows mine. So um, that's... A, that's... You, may, you may have overlooked that this is a mixed blessing, Patrick. The Lake District is where everybody disagrees about everything that happens on the land. So sure. you, can, you can have some of it if you want it. <laughs> uh, if we go to... So Adrian... Um, hold on, we're going to go back up a oh, bloody thing. I was just shown how to use this before we started, so it's not surprising that. So I can't see what the earlier questions were, but one of the early questions was, how did James, how do you get your message out? How do you, how do you hit the people who really matter? We're gonna go on for another uh, four minutes exactly. How do you hit the people who matter? How do you take the messages from English Pastoral, which I appreciate we, ha we haven't covered nearly enough. This is an English Pastoral uh, session and all we've done is, is sort of chat, but how do you lift some of those main lessons out and, and, and deliver them? Okay, so I've, 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 I, I don't have enough headspace or enough life to think it's my job to save the English countryside or to save British farming. I've, there are people who would like to elevate me to that position of grandeur, but uh, the truth is, Patrick, I don't have the time or the headspace. So I've told myself very clearly that's not my job. My job is to look after my kids, to look after my farm, make that the best that I can possibly do, try and beat Helen with Belted Galloways in about 25 years' time at the sales, uh, try and breed good Herbert Tups, try and write the best books I can, and I'm going to let the rest of it worry about itself. I do go on Twitter. I wish I didn't, but I go on Twitter. Um, I do occasionally have politicians and other people come here, but ultimately I'm a complete romantic about books. I look at somebody like Rachel Carson and I think, just write the book, James. Do the best you can. You're not Rachel Carson, but try your best. Just try your best. Put it out there. And what will be, will be. I, I can't carry the whole world on my shoulders. Sure. But from the position you've attained, though, um, you're now uh, somebody who, who somebody people listen to. You're, you're, you're a go-to. You were saying yesterday you've had ministers to visit, you have civil servants to visit, you had top agency bods to turn up. And you were yeah, right. but yeah, I know. They, that, they go straight into they go, they go straight into the House of Commons and refuse to sign that Amendment 16. Absolutely, um, yeah. Uh, what, you know, what, what a waste of time. I should have spent the time feeding them my tups or whatever. Um, they're full of it, aren't they? Um, it's, it's BS and it would eat your life up. And I don't know, I, I'm sticking at books. Books is what I do. Sure, no, absolutely. And, and it must say, it just absolutely chimes. 
I had a meeting recently with somebody who came out and seen what saw my cattle on the hill and said, great for biodiversity, great for local produce, great for heritage, great for everything. It's ticking all these boxes, but nobody wants to pay for it. And that's, that no. seemed to me to be the kind of situation we're in at the moment. You've got hope. I've got a bit of hope. Um, but fingers crossed, um, bits and pieces like English pastoral will, will generate kind of discussion that, that I hope will maybe start to value some of the stuff that farming, farming doesn't just have to be food. Farming could be absolutely everything. You can produce anything. That's all right. Just not, not long. I'm going to keep saying the name of your book because you keep saying the name of mine. Not long after Native came out, you did a thing on Twitter I saw um, where you very passionately, you were sort of pissed off and you said, we're having to hustle. Nobody really wants to pay the real price of farming the land in the right way where you look after cattle or whatever it might be in the right way for curlews. And yeah, all, what have we got? All, I mean, you and I, what have we got? Or anybody on here, all we've got is our votes, our shopping, our ability to communicate in whatever form we've got best. That's all we've got, isn't it? So we just, we just do the best we can, right? Sure. Sure, I think probably... Um we ought to stop, although, um, yeah, as I say, this could just roll and roll and roll and roll. Um, I was asked to say at the beginning that Wigton Wednesdays are free, um, and we've all, well, you, <laughs> you can value the conversation we've just had as you please, but uh, yeah, it was, it, these things are um, all. Wigton Book Festival um, really appreciates donations, so please do go and have a look on that and um, see what, if you can give something, that would be for the great for the festival it's been a really important thing been really helpful for all sorts of bits and pieces to do with books in galloway so um yeah please go and look at that uh, and in the meantime again buy english pastoral because it seems to be a bit of a competition between the two of us buy buy his book um and uh thank you very much i'm not sure now there was, was particular particular protocol for how we should stop this um so i think it's probably going to be about as awkward and as hellish as it could be at the moment i'm going to say what? let's stop yeah what about can I just say thank, thank you to you, thank you to the organisers, and thank you to all the lovely people. It's, um, this is the first one of these I've done where you can see if people are in the living rooms, uh, like cutting their toenails or whatever it is. So it's fantastic to be able to see everybody, and thank you for having me. Absolutely. Yeah, no, the same here. Thank you very, very much, everybody. That's been brilliant.